So last time we talked about zeolites, and we said the zeolites is a rock, and that rock carries with it cations, and those cations are embedded deep inside of those pores of the rock, and if we bring them into a laboratory and we heat them up, we drive off water, which is why they were called zeolite, the boiling stone, really. And we also see maybe some traces of sodium or calcium or potassium that is left behind. That's just a couple of possibilities, not the only possibility that's out there. So the question very early on after this discovery was made is how on earth can we extract the cations? Maybe they didn't want them there. Whatever they were using that zeolite stone for, maybe they did not want the contamination from all of these other cations that are in the picture now. So they needed a cleanup process. Or maybe they were actually bringing the zeolites in because they wanted to capture those cations and do more things with them. Maybe they wanted to basically contain the sodium or the magnesium or the calcium. Maybe they wanted to precipitate it out or do something funky with it that they could go or turn around and do something else with. So how can we extract the cations from the material? How can we isolate them for other purposes? This was the whole beginning of what we would call ion exchange. And this was a very hard process. No one liked to do it. Ion exchange basically means, hey, we got calcium here, Ca plus 2. And exchanging basically means you're going to swap it out. So you're going to have to go to your friend and you're going to have to say, hey, buddy, I'm your best buddy. So why don't you kick that one to the curve and why don't you hang out with me more? And you're going to have to rely on your friend to agree with it. Well, the same thing is going to happen here. Is there a way that we can take one cation, put it into the system, kick this one out, so this new cation can come into the picture? That's ion exchange. We're exchanging an ion, whether that is positive or whether that is negative. Ion exchange can happen on either side. Well, this was kind of labor intensive. No one really wanted to do it. It took forever in a lab. You were there at the lab bench all day long. And what would basically happen is that you would take this piece of glass tubing, kind of like what you used for your lycopene lab when you handmade your column, you would fill it with stationary phase and you would pour your sample through the top. Uh, through the system of different stationary phases, you would exchange one cation for another cation and that would come out into the very end. This was very controlled. You had to keep a watch on it. You had to make sure that the stationary phases didn't go dry. It could only house a certain amount of sample before you had to uh, basically recover the stationary phase or replace it with a new one. No one wanted the job. So it was very evident from the beginning that this process needed a little bit of automation. And this automation kind of led into the field of ion chromatography. Is there a way that we can kind of do this automatically, not have to be there as much, exchange some ions, and then out the other end it goes? And this is kind of what gave birth to the instrument that we are using today. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit more on you. Before this instrument came out, some research was done, right? And it was done by a major company. And then after they kind of put the final details on it, in 1975, we finally get a paper. And this paper and research and information was released by a company called Dionyx. At that time, Dionyx was a pretty new company. 
and they introduced the first IC system that we would now recognize as ion chromatography. At the same time, in the same month, I'm going to say that again, at the same time, during the same month, we get another company, and their name was Dow Chemical. And Dow Chemical published an article, and that article was about the IC technology. So who did it first? We get this thing from Dionics that says, hey, everybody, this is on chromatography, and you need to use it. And then we get an article from Dow Chemical that says, Hey, everybody, this is on chromatography, and this is why you need to use it, and this is how it works. Well, the answer to this is kind of convoluted, but it gives you an insight about business. What happened before 1975, right? This was kind of the lead-up point. 1975, articles were released that says, this is on chromatography. So there had to be years of research that went into this that led up to basically this rollout of the piece of equipment. What was going on prior to 1975? Who was in the laboratory? What were they doing? What kind of things were they looking for? We've already kind of talked about the zeolite stuff. Well, how did that make it to industry? And then eventually, how did it make it to a piece of equipment? Well... Prior to 1975, Dow Chemical was involved in a process. This process was extracting magnesium from seawater. Very similar to the zeolite stuff that was going on years prior. Here we have a substance, seawater. Seawater is not pure water. There's other things in it, just like the zeolite rock. That seawater was brought into Dow Chemical, and that seawater had in it cations, just like the zeolites did way back when. How can they extract magnesium from the seawater? Well, they knew that magnesium was an ant or a cation. They knew it was a charged ion. But how could they easily get it out of the seawater and maybe they could do something else with it instead? And what Dow Chemical came around and decided is that we would use the same technology of this ion exchange, right? I mean, that's kind of what we did back in the day. Why not just continue to use that system and just maybe slightly improve it? And they use these ion exchanged resins. Basically stationary phases. Think of them that way. And this happened about 1955. About the middle of the century. Well, of course, this is Dow Chemical. And Dow Chemical needed big scale. Big, big, big scale. Not little laboratory stuff that we're doing in the laboratory on a daily basis. And on exchanged resins kind of first began with what we would call ion exclusion. And the ion exclusion basically separated ions from non-ionic ones. That's why this is called ion exclusion. You exclude somebody from it. You don't want them involved. You exclude somebody from going out to the bar with you on a Friday or Saturday. That means you don't want them around. On exclusion is the same way. Pump something through on exclusion. And the ions are excluded. And you begin to separate the ions charged from the non-ions, which are neutral. Once we get the ions, maybe there's a cluster of them 
we're then going to have to separate these as well. Maybe. And that's kind of where ion exchange comes into play. We get a little more uh, detailed oriented with who hangs out with who after this point. So all of this stuff was going on in 1955. You might not have been around in 1955. Who knows? Well, the person that was kind of working on all of this stuff, uh, he did have a name. And he was hired for Dow Chemical, and his name was Hamish Small. Hamish Small worked at Dow, was hired into a group, and this group was studying electrolytes in water. Uh, electrolytes, of course, are positives and negatives. These are charged species that might be around that do a particular type of job, and he was hired in for that group. How can we separate electrolytes using water as an eluent? That is what he was tasked to do. Okay, so Hamish worked a little bit on what would be known eventually as ion chromatography. He focused on electrolytes, which were cations and anions, and he was pumping them through these ion-exchanged resins that Dow Chemical was making and using in their laboratories. And it was his job to figure out a way that if he gave him a soup of cations, let's say calcium and let's say magnesium. How can we separate these two from each other? That was what Hamish was working on. Is there a way? And we don't want to go crazy. We don't want to spend a lot of money into it, into the process at least. So we want something that's very easily done. It's not going to cost the company a lot of money. And we would really love it if you could keep it in an aqueous environment. And Hamish said, okay, fine. I'll begin to work on this stuff. I'll try to figure out a way to separate these cations from each other. It's not going to be easy. You know, some of them carry the same types of charge. In this case, both of them are plus twos. But I'll play around with these ion exchanged resins. And we'll modify them and we'll change them. And we'll figure out what happens and what works. And that's exactly where Hamish's studies started. So in the lab, what Hamish did was three things. Number one, they wanted to synthesize, a.k.a. make, ion exchange resins. These were kind of, again, the stationary phases, think of them that way, that would separate the ions from each other. Number two, they also wanted to define, really, these resin properties. So play around with them. Let's see what they do. Does one route work better than another? If so, then we need to figure out what those properties are. So that way we've got more control to make a better resin in the future. And finally, three, the group was given a task to find applications. Right. If we're going to sink all of this work into this, then we're going to market it. So you're going to make these resins, play around with the stationary faces, see what works and see what doesn't work. And then when you find out something that works, look at it a little closer and figure out chemically how is it working better. That way you can build an even better one the next time. And then number three, Find applications. Once you get something that works, let's sit down and brainstorm and kind of think of why someone would want to use this in the first place. Okay. Now, I know you're probably snickering when I say that because it's kind of like, well, what on earth are you thinking? Shouldn't you have the applications first? 
Shouldn't you have an idea of what these people would want to do with it before you go through the trouble? And the answer is, yeah, that's how normal people think. But, however, keep in mind, Dow had a process that they wanted to do. Personally, they wanted to extract that magnesium from the seawater. So they were really in it for themselves. How can they make their job easier? Well, if you're going to go through all of this trouble and you find something that works for Dow, then why not sit down at the drawing board and think about why other people would want to use it and that way you could sell them that technology or that concept to make their life better in a laboratory as well. So here's Mr. Hamish Small. And uh, as you can see, he was kind of fairly young when he began at Dow, but he was thrown into basically this laboratory that had other researchers and co-workers, and they were all working on the same kind of concept, and they were talking back and forth to each other. Some of the brightest minds really during that time in that particular laboratory that really was trying to focus on the techniques of ion exchanging. Uh, now, whether or not this is an IC behind him, it's probably maybe one of the first models, but you can at least see some instrumentation that's behind him on the counter. Again, this was way back into the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, this was uh, way before, you know, modern computers kind of came out and was commonplace in a lab. Uh, so technology and instrumentation is going to look a little bit differently back in the day. Uh, but this is Mr. Small, and he is going to be kind of given credit to the first kind of full-blown IC system or eventually what led into the first full-blown IC system a little bit later on. So after Hamish Small and his co-workers go into the laboratory and they go and try to tackle these three objectives, synthesizing the resins, defining their properties, and thinking about applications, he comes back to the supervisors and he says, guys, listen, we're in the laboratory and we're working with some things and we're seeing some problems. And these are the things that we are having difficulty monitoring and measuring in the lab. So the very first things that they had problems with were basically the alkali metals. He's saying, we're having a problem with alkali metals for some reason. We really can't separate those at all yet. And then he says, alkaline earth metals. Alkaline earth metals are basically everything in column number two on the periodic chart. That's your magnesium and that's your calciums. Trying to get those separated from each other. The same thing happened with number one. All the alkali metals, they carry with them the same charges. So it's very difficult for them to kind of separate species that have the same charges with each other. Ammonium is going to be another one. Uh, here we've got ammonium, which is NH4, and trying to get that from all of the other maybe positive one species is going to be a little difficult as well. They were having some problems with ammonium. They also reported that they were having problems with the halides. The halides are all of the negative one categories, and that's your fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodides. So they're having difficulty there. And finally, number five, we are having some problems with our sulfates and our nitrates. Uh, those are um, negative ones, negative twos. Phosphates, uh, those are your negative threes. And your carbonates, which are also negative twos. The reason that they were having problems with these is think about them. They all have the oxygens involved, right? This sulfate is SO4, what four, nitrate, NO. Three phosphate PO three PO four. Which one is it? You better look at your ion chart. I ain't gonna tell you all the answers. And your carbonates are CO something. You gotta find out what they are. So all of these had oxygens on the center of them, and all of these oxygens were causing some complications as well in the lab. So they basically reported back and said, "Listen." We have problems with everything. Yeah, you know you wanted us to do this, and we are. 
and we can separate the alkali metal from an alkaline earth, or we can separate a halide from an alkali metal. But the problem is when we are working within the same family. If we're working in the same family, we're having some complications. And you told us to keep it simple, folks. And we don't really know of a way to be able to separate positive ones from each other. Or positive twos from other positive twos. And we don't really know a simple way to separate all of these polyoxy anions either. Those are your sulfates and your nitrates and your phosphates and your carbonates. And we don't know how to separate the negative ones, all the halides from each other. So, back to the drawing board. As you can imagine, the supervisors really didn't like to hear the story. They were making small progressions, but it wasn't something that they wanted to hear. They thought that they would be able to do a little bit better. Well, they continue to work on the product. They continue to work on the system. They continue to work on the separation. And in the next video, we'll talk about what they did in the next step to try to make this a better process in the end.